uh, and, and she kind of has camp voice, so she didn't see a lot. Did you guys notice that? So thank you, Amy, for doing everything. And Joey spent some time with the guys, so thank you, Joey. Oh, yeah! Yeah! And, uh, Praise the Lord. We, we continue to believe that our kids are important because they were important to Jesus. And so uh, I want to just pray a prayer of blessing over them, and then uh, you guys get to be up here and then continue to have fun and learn a lot about Jesus, all right? So let's pray real, real, real quick this morning. Uh, Father, I am so grateful uh, for what you're doing in our kids' lives. Father, I thank you for the testimonies, for the, the good things that happen at camp this year. And God, I pray that that would continue to grow in their lives. I pray as they go downstairs, God, let them have a ton of fun and learn that they would learn about you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, kids, let's go ahead and Show everybody how in order you can be. There we go. There we go. You guys got it. Right to left, Amber. Well, I've been uh, I've been excited uh, to continue our study through the Sermon on the Mount. I have. Ten pages of notes this morning. I could have had more. I had to stop writing because I was like, wow, this is just so good. I encourage you. Can I encourage you with everything within me? Love the Word of God and study it. Eat it every day. It's nourishment to it. It's encouraging to it. It, it, it gives us faith. It gives us joy. It, it gives us life. It, like feeds our very soul. So if you if you come in if you come in on Sunday morning or you just end it during the day and you're just like <coughs> my, my soul it feels empty. I'm tired. I'm weary. Man, get in the word. Take a moment. Dude, take a little break. Say, all right, God, I just want to let me eat from your your word. It's it's good. It's described like like honey. It's described sweet. It's described like bread. It's nourishing. It's, it's, it's sustaining. And so I want to encourage you. Study the Word. they got so many Bible study programs online. they got so many apps you can get. I mean, get in the Word of God. Like, we're without excuse. Living in America, we've got it. Speak a different language, they got it. Like, it's... it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so we're going to be continuing in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, somebody asked me recently, are we still in Matthew chapter 5? I said, yes, there's still good stuff. And we're going to continue. We're going to move on a little bit. So we're going from Matthew 5. We were the last few weeks talking about Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about righteousness I like righteous, righteousness. I told you guys. I confessed it. I like rules. They make me feel safe. They make me feel comforted. But Jesus, when he showed up on the scene, he said, I have not come to get rid of the rules. I've come to fulfill the rules. And then he challenges us at the very end of that passage. He says that our righteousness should exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so what we're going to look at, um, it's not going to be the next couple weeks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the next while. And we're going to look at six different units, six different ways that Jesus described how our, uh, how our righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he, and he says it this way. This is the way that, that Jesus introduces these topics over the next couple weeks. He says, you have heard that it was said this way, and he'll bring up a law or bring up a command. And then he says, but I say to you this, and what Jesus says every time he does this, he goes, and you have heard it said this, and I say to you this, almost every time, I think he, he ups the ante, he ups, he ups the what it looks like to be obedient to God in this way. He ups the way that it looks like to love your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And in today, it, it's no different, but we're going to get into topics over the next period of time, and we're going to get into today, we're going to be talking about emotions over the next couple weeks. And we're going to talk about lust and sex. We're going to talk about divorce and marriage. We're going to talk about promises and oaths. We're going to talk about retaliation. We're going to be talking about how we relate to enemies. And all <coughs> these subjects are going to be covered as we look through the rest of Matthew chapter 5. So there's a whole lot more to get into. So today, 
we're going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 5, and we're just going to cover two verses. And like I said, two verses, but I got ten pages of notes. Uh, it's, it's, it is packed full. Jesus' words are, and they're packed full of meaning. They're fact, packed full of application. And so I want to encourage you again, read the word. It, it, is, you, it can't get old. I mean, this week, uh, I, was, I met with Poppy with Kurt on Friday. And he, re he introduced, or maybe reintroduced a verse to me that's been in the Bible the whole time, and I had just not, not seen it before, or not remembered it before, but uh, it's, the word of God is good. It's always new. It's always life-giving. So let's look today, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 21 and 22 this morning. It says this, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with a brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to hell of fire. Man. Just reading that again, I'm like, oh my. Say, did you murder anybody this week? I have to be careful with this. We're gonna work, we're gonna work through this. So I believe that as we look at this, this passage of scripture, it, it reveals two aspects of God's character that should bring us joy and peace, while also warning us who follow Jesus as king. And so the first thing that I see very clearly, again, in this passage of Scripture, that God is life. Amen. God loves life. Everything He does, everything He says, all of it, it promotes life. It's life-giving. We're encouraged, we are, I, last week I, I mentioned, or maybe it was two weeks ago, we had a missionary last week, two weeks ago I had mentioned this at the beginning of my sermon, that God's words to us, they're good, they bring life, even when they bring conviction, so even when they're hard to hear, even when they point out inside of us what, what's wrong in our life, it's still good, it's still life, it's for the purpose of of bringing us life. It's for the purpose of bringing us righteousness, building us up into Christ. And so we should learn as believers, as followers of Jesus, that even the hard words from Jesus, it's good. It's meant to produce life in us. From the moment God breathed breath of life in Genesis chapter 7, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 7, till all for all of eternity, his will is to promote life. The Ten Commandments and, and all of the laws, they were written to protect and uphold life. They were, the, the way they were written, man, we're going to get into a couple of them, and they're written to promote life. It's, it's to promote uh, safety. It, it's to protect the weak. It's to hold up the standard of life, to give us, like Jesus says in the New Testament, to give us life and to give it more abundantly. So Jesus promotes this truth when he speaks Matthew 5, verse 21. Again, he repeats this command, and again, he's not abolishing it, he's not getting rid of it, he's upholding it. For him to say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus was repeating it, not to abolish it, but to uphold it. Murder is not of God. God is a God of life. He sustains life. He encourages life. He speaks life. He breathes life into us. Premeditated killing, murder of another life, is subject to judgment. This is this should this truth should encourage us as believers that we serve a God who is just, and He does deal justly with those who take life. I know this last week we had a tragedy strike our nation 
on a mass scale in two different ways. This is not from God. This is not the way of Christ. This is not the way of the king. It does not reflect God's character. God upholds life and he judges those who take life. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says this, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, they face judgment. All will face judgment for the deeds done on earth. This is radically good news. Why? Because when I think about all of the injustices in life, when I think about the injustices around the globe, when I think about what has just happened in the U.S. over the last seven days, I can say, pray the Lord that I serve a king who is just and will judge the actions of those on earth. And you think, oh, some people get away with things, or, or why does this people seem to prosper? Trust me, judgment belongs to the Lord. And he will judge those who take life. In the case of the murderer who has not repented, it does not look good. Romans chapter 12, <coughs> verse 19, also speaks about the judgment of the Lord, the judgment that's coming, the vengeance that's coming. It belongs to the Lord, and it's his wrath that is stored up for those who choose to go against his ways. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends. I mean, oh, we're going to get into this in the second portion of this, uh, of this verse this morning. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, but it says here, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends. We want to take vengeance, and we want to see justice now. And that is, I want to encourage that, that is, a, that is a, the righteousness of Christ in us, that when we see injustices, we want to do something. We want to change this. We want to speak for it. We want to make a change. But the Bible encourages us again to not take Revenge. Do not take upon yourself a revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I said at the beginning, there's two truths that I'm going to cover this morning that should bring joy to us. It should bring peace to us. The fact that Jesus is love, that he is the judge, it should bring us joy and it should bring us peace that he is going to make right what has been wrong. The wrath of God is waiting for those who take life. God loves life, and he upholds it in his judgments. God is a God of justice, and sin does not go unnoticed. Murder does not go unnoticed. And this brings joy to my heart, brings peace to my heart, to know that God is in control, and he is the one that takes these situations upon himself to set right. Is there forgiveness for the sinner? It's also revealed through uh, for the sinner or for the murderer. It also reveals that God is a just God and that he will forgive all of their sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive all of our sin. So I believe as much as I believe <coughs> there, is, there is judgment, there is wrath, there is a vengeance from the Lord, that there is also forgiveness, there is also freedom. So for no matter what ways that we've broken the laws of God or the commands of God, that he is faithful and just and will forgive us when we have what a true repentant heart towards him. So in Matthew chapter 5, we see this rule, and I think all of us, we nod our heads and say, yes, uphold that, Jesus. Yes, fulfill that, that there is judgment for murderers. But then Jesus begins to up the ante. Like I said, he makes these statements. You've heard it said this way, but I say to you this. And so this morning, I think there's word that would apply to all of us in the room. 
And I think we can all identify with this. So let's read again in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, the second part. It says this, But I say to you that everyone who is angry <coughs> with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. I don't know about you, when I first, when I read this again this week, I was like, Jesus, you just, you just lumped me in with a whole bunch of murders. Anybody who gets angry with a brother, anybody who, who insults his brother, anybody who says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And all of a sudden, there before the cross is equal playing field. Sometimes we feel really good about ourselves because we spend a little time with the Lord. We love His presence. Hey, I, I've read my Bible. Oh, I've, I've done some good things. And, and oh, I just told a little bit of lie. Or oh, I, you know, I didn't get my anger get to me a little bit here or there. No, Jesus ups the ante. He says, hey, it's a level playing field. Whether you're a murderer or you get angry with your brother, you're on the same playing field. There's judgment for both. And I said, oh, Lord. Forgive me. Oh Lord, forgive me. If we're going to be a people who, who live like the king, then we've got to get our emotions in check. Look, when I first started this uh, series, I mentioned that many times we'll say we're really good at justifying ourselves, right? We, 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 our anger gets the best of us and we're like, oh, it's okay, I really didn't mean to do that. Well, here we find that, that that moment of it's okay, oh, that moment of emotion, oh, that moment of, of loose tongue moment, that flowing of insult from our mouth towards another, that calling of foolishness, that calling of cursing on a brother, those moments are just as grievous to the Lord as the murderer. Andrew, make me feel good. I want you to make me feel good on Sunday mornings. Jesus ups the ante and equates it with murder. When our emotions get the best of us, our words still matter. I'm preaching to myself this morning. I hope you guys know that. <laughs> when our emotions get the best of us, our words still matter. Jesus again confronts our it's okay, I was just angry excuses with this passage again this morning. Why, you ever wonder this, why do our words matter? The scriptures are full of descriptions of how uh, we have life or death in our words. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says it this way very clearly. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Jesus talks about this in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 to 37. He makes this statement in the middle of there, talking about the judgment to come, talking about standing before him as a judge. And it says this, that we will give account for every careless word that we speak. See me when when my when my son or my spouse really annoys me and I, I just let my tongue slide like like that's not okay that, that's not okay but we will stand and account for everything that we say why because our words have the power of life and death one way this convicts me. And when I'm like, oh, why? I know that I spewed death. I know that I spewed poison. As we're going to look at a, a few more verses here. But it also encouraged me and gave me joy. Your tongue, my tongue, our words have the power to give life. Amen. We have a great opportunity to speak life into others. To speak life into situations. To speak life into our home. To speak life into our, our, our workplaces. Let's look here. The tongue has enormous power and is for good, and to be used, it can be used for good and evil. 
In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 21, it, it speaks about the tongue has the power to comfort and to give hope. And I love those words. I love when I'm around a believer, when I'm around a follower of Jesus, and uh, when they're submitting to him as king, and, and man, when they speak to me, and I'm going through something, and I'm struggling, and I'm down in my wits, and they speak a word, and all of a sudden, in my spirit, in my soul, I'm comforted. That's the kind of strength we have in our tongue. It, it also says that our tongue, a word of slander, that it can destroy a reputation. <coughs> That's in Psalms chapter 56 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Our, our tongue, the, the slanderous words that we have, it has the power to destroy a reputation. We have to be careful about what words we speak about another. We have to be careful about the, 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 the eagerness sometimes to gossip and to slander those who are around us because it has the power to destroy. In Proverbs chapter 22, Verse 6, it encourages parents in the room. How many parents? We've got a few parents in the room, right? We have some kids. Our words are powerful, and they can be used in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, to teach the truth of God's word, setting our children up for life. Man, i got to be careful. I'm more cautious about my words now. I have Denver in the house. i got to be careful. Hey, when I speak to him, I have the power in my words to speak truth of God to him that will set him up for the path of life. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 22, 2 Timothy 2, 22, it, it says that, 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 they, that people have heard the wise words and they're to entrust them to reliable people who will also be able to trust others. The words that we have in our mouth are able to steer young people through life. If we're able to steer other people through life by speaking to them the words of wisdom that God has spoken to us. Our words are powerful. Psalms, and the contrary, Psalms chapter 64, verse 3, it says that bitter words are like arrows. They're like arrows penetrating people, searing them. Psalms 140, verse 3, the words can be like poison of a serpent. James 3, 6, the tongue can be like a fire. It can set a whole forest on blaze. It can cause great destruction. But good words, but godly words, but words submitted to Jesus, they give life. Proverbs 15, verse 23, says that the words from a righteous man brings joy in season. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. We have the power in our, in our tongues, in our mouth, in our words to, to cease or to stop an argument. You guys have been in those situations before, I'm sure. That one moment when you're in an argument and you know if I say this word, this argument can continue and I know it's going to irritate them to their core and I want to go ahead and speak it anyway. The Bible encourages those of us in that room, in the room that are like that, I'm guilty too. It says that a soft answer, the softest, the kindest of our voice can turn away wrath, can change the situation, can change the argument. I may remember that sometimes. I don't know, maybe you did too. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11. The mouth of the righteous, I love this, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Our mouth, the, the words that we speak have the ability to be a fountain of life. To 
build one another up, to encourage one another. That's why our greeting time, as much as I talk about how long it goes, it is amazing. Because in these moments, we have the opportunity to speak to one another and encourage one another and speak life. Man, we got, I mean, you guys know it. In life, we get a lot of people say a lot of different things. I love working as customer service because I had an opportunity, even when people came to me and they complained, and this is wrong, and you did this, and it's your fault, and I was able to just turn their answer around and bring life to the situation until I started turning some customers around where they used to be the ones that nobody liked, and then they, they came and they, they enjoyed it. All of a sudden, they liked being around. It, it was life-giving. We have this power, those who are submitted their lives Fully to Jesus as King, the righteous, the righteous person's words are a fountain of life. So, warning to us found in this Matthew chapter five, verse twenty-two passage. A warning to us who follow Jesus, who follow Jesus, but allow our emotions to get the best of our words. In here, Jesus speaks three different times that those who are angry with their brother will be liable to judgment. Those who insult their brother will be liable to judgment. Those who say, you fool, will be liable to the hell fire. He repeats this three different times, encouraging us. Our words have power. Next week, we're going to, uh, next week Rachel and I will be on vacation, actually. Uh, Levi from Kai Alpha here at UW will be speaking and bringing a really powerful, encouraging word. So the week after that, I'll be returning and we'll be continuing this series talking about anger. If we have anger, if we have a, a fence against our brother, the, the scripture continues and gives us instruction about when we're worshiping, what we should do, and how we can reconcile relationships and so I'm going to be focusing on the, the, that first part of the verse, the anger, um, anger with the brother, fault with the brother, offense with the, with the brother, or a sister, a human, a, 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 a follower of Jesus. But this morning, I'm going to dive in a little bit more on verse 22, the last portion. It says, whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And I was studying again this week, I was reminded Jesus not only says this word, he says that, that those who say you fool will be, will be liable to hellfire, but Jesus also calls the religious, religious leaders fools. And, and Paul, in his, in his writings, talking to the different churches, will, will often, he, he would sometimes call himself a fool, and he would often call members of the church fool. And so I wondered to myself, I said, okay, what, what's going on here? Why, why does it seem to be this contradiction? And, and Jesus said in, Matthew, in Luke, Luke 24, 25, he said to the religious leader, he declared that they were fools. This is where sometimes I think I, I would love to speak a language other than English. Uh, when uh, when that Rachel laughed at me because she knows I have a hard time learning other languages. Um, but uh, but when I when I look at even even my my awesome neighbor from Venezuela, they're speaking Spanish and they have like you know a, a couple different ways to express love. They have they have a few different ways to express uh, their their feelings and their emotions. And when I when I look and I study the Greek text, so so the New Testament was written in Greek. There's like more than one word that says. This fool. There's more than one meaning when it's talking about fools, and so this is where I really think the English language. Sometimes I'm like, oh, we're, we're limited to to express the interpretation of scripture. But there there are two distinct, um, there are actually three distinct words that describe fool or foolish. So the first fool or foolish that Jesus used, and also that Paul uses uh, multiple times in his scripture, is is a foolish, which means that they are uninformed or unwise. 
So when Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders, they thought they knew everything, they thought they had everything in order, they thought they understood the scriptures fully, and he said, you're fools, you don't understand that this is the way of sacrifice. When Paul was speaking about foolishness, they were, they were foolish in your ways, he would say that, uh, he says it that, that way often, you are unwise in your ways. Here, and they bring, and then in both instances, when Jesus uses it, and when Paul uses it, he then they then bring forth the truth. So they declare, hey, you're unwise, you're uninformed, you don't know these things, and then they bring forth a truth. This is not the type of foolishness that Jesus was speaking of in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. The foolishness that, that he is speaking of is one that is it, it's, it's to call somebody empty-headed, Oh, Andrew, that means unwise. No. But it's empty-headed. Empty-headed. It's a term of reproach. It's a term of curse. It's a term of, of final judgment. It's a term of character. Foolishness. A term that was used as a reproach. In the, in the Greek language, I can could, I could use the word raka, but nobody would care what that means. Jesus says here, those who say you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And to interpret that this morning, to make that clear, those who say you are cursed will be held to held liable of the fire of judgment. It's describing when your anger gets the best of you and you declare someone a fool, making a judgment on their character and cursing their life. I could use a whole bunch of language up here, but that's totally uncommon for me to use. But to declare to somebody they're a fool is to declare over them a curse. And you can think of colorful languages, the, the colorful language that you don't normally use, and you can identify what I'm meaning this morning. In this passage, the character of God is revealed that God is life, but secondly, it, it reveals in this passage that Jesus alone is judge. And so what happens in those moments, you're in a fit of rage, you have aim. Your emotions are getting the best of us. And all of a sudden, whether it may, actually, I should take it back. Maybe it's in a fits of rage. It could be just your common language. And you speak a curse over somebody in the middle of your anger or just with your words. This is not in line with God's character. Our words have power of life and death. And God and Jesus here right now is getting a, a conviction that you cannot speak a word, or you should not speak a word. Those who speak words of cursing over somebody's life, they're holding a judgment over their life that Jesus himself doesn't hold. And Jesus himself is the only one that can hold judgment over somebody's character. And again, he only speaks life. He's never going to curse a life. In John chapter 5, verse 22, it says this, Not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son. So what's happening? When all of a sudden we get angry, or all of a sudden we are, we're, we're being careless with our words, and we speak a curse over somebody's life, we're doing the exact same thing that Satan did, wanting to sit in the place of judgment, wanting to sit on the throne, wanting to receive worship. We're choosing in our moment of rage, on our moment of, of un, un, uncared for thought, an uncared for tongue, <coughs> to put ourselves as judge or that individual's life. Do not declare another you fool, or you will be liable to help. Do not, do not um, declare over another raka. It's a, it was a vulgar, vulgar form of curse 
or our Sunday's life. Do not do it. Because why? Because it is not your place to be a judge. To do so is usurping yourself and your judgment and your words above the words of God. It's a warning to us this morning. Jesus says, or sorry, the scripture says in Genesis 1.26 that we were made in God's image and we were called good. To call somebody rock, to curse a brother, to bring a vulgar curse against another is to refute the nature of God in them. And it's not our place. For Jesus alone is judge, and not even the Father will speak a word of judgment. Jesus has this ability throughout all of the Sermon of the Mount to up the ante, to put us sometime like today on even playing the playing ground as the murderer. Our words have power. And this morning, it's a reminder to us, it's an encouragement to us to allow our words to be fully submitted to Jesus. That even in the, in the following terms, our emotions, the anger we have, the, the, the guilt we have towards another person, we cannot put ourselves in the place of judgment over another. That, that's not our place. And when we do, we're liable to the flames of hell. So this morning we have to wrestle with this question, wow, have my words produced death, have produced a curse in another, or have my words been used for life and giving life to another? And if we find ourselves in the place this morning where we say, yeah, my words, I have spoken in my rage and in my emotion, I have allowed my words to be careless, and I have cursed my children, I have cursed my neighbors, maybe you cursed your, your co-workers because you've made a judgment over them that God hasn't made, This morning, the opportunity for us is to repent and say, Oh, Lord, forgive me. And to release, release the other from the curse. Our words have power. And so it's, I, I believe the steps isn't just, Hey, Lord, forgive me for the ways that my words have led to cursing others. But I believe it's also in the place of saying, Lord, forgive me. And Lord, release them from the judgment I've made. Because the, the, the way that this is written in, in Matthew chapter 22 is, is an, an internal curse that is made over somebody. An eternal judgment that is made over somebody. And it's not our place. Lord, forgive us. So this morning, I want to take an opportunity to pray. Say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, give me grace. Give me strength that I may submit all of my emotions, all of my words to you. That I would be somebody like you, Jesus, who speaks life to another and not death and judgment. I believe that as we continue to submit our life to Jesus' Lordship, that we will look more and more like him and it will affect the very words that we speak our words have power this morning and i believe that god wants to give us power to speak life let's pray this morning father i am so grateful and so humbled again to be able to speak your words and God, I know, uh, as I was reading and studying again these words, Lord, it brought conviction to my heart in, in areas and times and memories I have of when my words, Father, didn't speak life. They weren't life-giving, but they spoke death and they spoke curses over others. Father, I pray that in this moment, God, that we would be forgiven and we would be set free. And Father, I pray not only would we be set free from this, uh, from this sin, but God, that, we would also, uh, that you would also release those who we have spoken curses over. God, it is not our place to judge, but yours. And Father, I pray and I thank you that you are a 
good judge, that you are a righteous judge, and you judge rightfully. So, Father, I pray that now you would take your place. And, Father, that we would be removed from that place of judgment. In Jesus' name.